Uh, let's talk about the weight of history. Um, the 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 <laughs> particularly it seems an odd thing. This is the weight of history in Alok Sharma, but he has had the weight of history on his shoulders, David. Well, what, what I was interested in about this was a lot of the time we talk about politics as a bit of a game. You know, who's up, who's down, who's doing what and so on. They're in, they're out. Someone's secretary of this for five weeks and this, then they have to resign over something. Um, but every now and again, what they have to do is really, really important. You remember Tony Blair, the Good Friday Agreement, saying, I feel the weight of history. I'm not trying to, I don't want to use a cliche, but weight of history is on <laughs> a hand of history is on my shoulder or so on, whatever it was. And it was. It just absolutely was. Again, when he had to make the speech after 9-11 to the TUC, uh, the TUC uh, conference short speech and so on, and then later, it was a really kind of significant moment. What he said and did mattered, not just kind of now, but mattered for years to come and so on. Uh, and we've had several such kinds of moments, really, where it's been... And I thought that with Alec Sharma, when he was tearing up a bit at the end of, of, of COP, which was, I think he probably, during the process, really come to understand, as many more people did, just how important and vital and totally central all this is etc. And he did feel that weight of history. And I wonder what you thought about that, Danny, because uh, um, because you've been close to some of these people. Yeah, I do. I do think um, he did feel that. Interestingly, when he'd taken the COVID press conferences, I hadn't been very impressed with Alex Sharma, and I was a bit surprised he was appointed to this. I thought maybe he was being sidelined. But lots of people in government told me, you know, he's actually a very bright guy um, and probably was the right person. And I, I think he did do quite a good job. I mean, I think it was just intrinsically very hard, uh, that job. It reinforces my view that in the end, what's going to relieve the situation if indeed anything does, will be technological developments, that it's actually the scientists who are going to uh, solve or not solve uh, this problem. But nevertheless, I'm sure he did... Uh, it was interesting how deeply he felt even the small compromise they had to make at the end and felt that that was a failure and felt that he'd had uh, the responsibility um, for trying to negotiate something better. So, uh, And it was also interesting the reaction to that. He clearly had the sympathy of the... Um, of the hall with him on it. So um, he'd clearly done a good job in bringing people round to him. So I think people like him. So, I, but I also just meant was the, if you like, the kind of the size of the responsibility. Yes. I mean, some people wear responsibility very so lightly that you think actually they're not really aware <laughs> of what it is. You know, they're so, not aware. Some, some people wear it so light, as lightly as they wear their suits, uh, for this uh, is the case uh, of the Prime Minister. Uh, yeah, I mean, or, 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 or appear, it, it appears either not it, to bother them at all or they don't kind of see it in that way or it's a, it's an easy yeah, thing. No. So I'm really struck at those moments when you when they have become fully aware of just what an important thing it is they're doing and how it's going to have such a huge effect it's on people's certainly, lives. Look, it's certainly been my experience in the Prime Ministers I've dealt with that they have felt very keenly that they have responsibility for people's lives and for very big issues and at particular big moments. That's definitely the case. And um, it definitely, you know, that, that when you're prime minister, you you don't get relief from that very much at all. It's one of the reasons everyone always goes, oh, they really like checkers. I think checkers is the one place where they can probably do that work and get some form of relief at the same time. So it's one of the reasons. But I also like wondered, you, you, I, I don't know whether you remember that Chris Rock comic routine about the mate of his who says, you know, I'm, he's, he's going to run for president, and Chris Rock says, "What on earth would you have a? Would you think you could be president for? You know, you don't kind of kind of walk along the street and somebody says, who do you think would be president?' So you know, I think it'd be really good. It'd be me, uh, uh, and so on. And yet, somebody effectively has to. You know, who'd be really good at running large bits of the world with the incredible complexity and total responsibility? It's going to be me. I mean, I'm the guy for it, and so on. You think, well, the very person who says that probably has a screw loose, so you don't want to give them the job. That's the old kind of. That's the old kind of joke. And then at this moment. It is you, and you do have the responsibility. Are you really up to it? I would have such a feeling of, no, um, totally wrong. Uh, yeah. Give it to someone else. It's interesting, because they certainly, all the people I'm talking about, have got a fairly healthy self-belief, actually. So I do I do think that it probably is required, and you do have to think, yes, I actually could make these uh, decisions. And... I think it's a relatively good system whereby the people that get there often are the people among, you know, the the small group of people you probably would choose to do that in in terms of in terms of the the pool the pool of people right because you've got to start with the pool of members of parliament. Um, we've obviously got another discussion as to whether or not a parliamentary system is the is the best way of choosing an executive leader. But if you do, then from among those people, they probably are the better people. I'd say this one's broken down a little bit in recent years, but, but still. But it's inter interesting, because I remember interviewing uh, Tony Blair once about, specifically about the 97 campaign and how they sort of relentless uh, uh, war on complacency. 
So they constantly, you know, behaved as if they were going to lose again, right? Despite the fact the polls all the way through were sort of saying they were one bit of it. And speaking to him about watching the results coming in, uh, and I remember he said that as the first results come in, uh, because Labour seats tend to count more quickly. At one point, it was sort of a hundred Labour seats and one Tory, and he was the only person in Britain hoping that there would be going to be more Tory, wishing that Tories would be more seats. But he, he sort of talked about a sort of real gulf moment. He was so focused on the campaign that when he then walks up Downing Street, this is all suddenly a bit real. There's a there's a moment when you sort of walk in and think, oh blimey! It's not like you said, David. It's not just the sort of Westminster political game of who's up and who's down and who's got a good writer no, in the Guardian. It. That's it. He goes on to the South Bank and says, "A new dawn has broken." Does it not? And I don't know whether does the B U G G E R word count as a word I can't use <laughs> on this program because I'm never. Gonna... Uh... They're not listening. He's looking, he's, looking, right. he's looking through the classifier <laughs> now. Well, if I was in, you know, I did, the, the, a new dawn has broken, has broken, has it not? And then in your mind, oh, bugger. Yeah. <laughs> and then you walk in, and then it's one of the first or second things they do is start talking to you about lettuce and nuclear submarines and, and, and all that sort of thing. But I suppose, at least if you're Prime Minister, you're aware slightly of your place in history. Literally, you know, you know the line. If you're Alok Sharma... Like you said, Tally, I mean, not the most impressive person at the press conference. A slightly dull, perfectly pleasant, but slightly dull man suddenly catapulted into Absolutely. David, I saving think the planet. When you ask the question, you know, oh, has the system broken down? We have changed the system. And the way that we've changed the system is that, that instead of it being chosen by parliamentary party, it's now chosen by members. And I, I don't think that's a very good change. Uh, I think, by and large, it, it's better for the, the parliamentary party chooses because I think, you know, Take the limits of the of the pool of people that you've got out of the question. At, at least those people can make some judgments from seeing those people close up, and you'd get different leaders. I think. I was all for it. You know that change to members. I it was all about involving more people, etc. When Ed Miliband made that infamous change that everybody was down on, I've kept very quiet about this since. I thought, <laughs> yeah, this might be quite a good idea. Draw people in, etc. Um, I've had a few second thoughts since then. Yeah, maybe maybe it's not. Quite, well, so well, let's, let's stick with the House of Commons and uh, M one MP in particular, uh, Sir Christopher Chope, uh, knighted for services to being a bloody nuisance in the House of Commons. Uh, he's previously blocked bills uh, that would have made upskirting a criminal events subjected to a bill that would give councils greater scope to take girls at risk of female genital mutilation. He's also stopped female parliamentarians using the Commons Chamber to mark the centenary of women's suffrage. And now. Uh, he's piped up and stopped them uh, overturning the, uh, the yes, stopped, he overturned the government's attempt to overturn the attempt to overturn the punishment of Owen Patterson. <laughs> Got lost there somewhere. Um, uh, Danny, Christopher well, Choke, discuss. <laughs> look, it's, he, let's start with this. He he has an assertion that there's, we, we legislate too much, uh, that there are too many of such motions and that he should use his power to prevent uh, things going through on the nod. Um, and uh, that would be fine if I thought he was right. Um, <laughs> you know, if I, if, I, if, I felt that, if I felt that principle was one that should be upheld, I'd kind of uh, be, uh, be pleased at his obstinacy. But he, he should look at, you know, if you look at it for, for a second, he can see that the proportion of things that he's stopping that are actually things that we want to do, that even he suggests he actually wants to do, um, are greater than the ones that he's that the ones that he's preventing that he doesn't want. So um, it's just you know he's acting in a the sort of dogmatic and silly way that um, I always disapprove of. Um, so, <laughs> so, so you know, so in general, so he deserves the criticism that he's um, that, that he's getting. By the way, in this particular instance, he's done us a favour. I think it's a good thing there's going to be yet another debate of what the government tried to do. Um, if the government is embarrassed over what happened, it should be embarrassed over it. So I'm not of this of all the ones that he's done. I, I'm less bothered about this one actually than I normally yeah, am. Yeah, what I was interested in uh, about all this was exactly that kind of species of MP. Usually, people in very safe seats for whichever their party is. Usually, people who are long past realizing they're never going to get a ministerial career whose self-identity is bound up with the business of being a, a nuisance and stopping things from happening and so on. I mean, you used to have people like Eric Forth back in the old yeah, days. Yeah, if you remember the bills, one, yeah, yeah. It's the right. same thing. Yeah. It's the same principle, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's absolutely the, the, the yeah. same thing. And in a way, it wouldn't really matter what the actual thing was. I mean, it might be kind of stopping bills you don't like. It might be always making sure that um, members, uh, private members' bills ran out of time as a matter of principle and so on. But they would find, or in the case of Tandiel accusing everybody of being part of a conspiracy which had to be investigated, 
appreciated immediately and so on. But they would find some kind of personification, they'd find some form of gratification in this, if you like, the kind of the backwaters of parliamentary politics. And that psychology is really quite interesting because for quite a lot of MPs, and we talk about second jobs and so on, and etc. But let's face it, for some MPs, there's not a lot to do. <laughs> you know, there's not a vast amount for, for, for them but to do. if you've been an MP for a long time and you've got a safe seat... Yeah, you've got your constituency office up and working. They know how to do it. It doesn't raise that many problems anyway because it's some, some kind of leafy part of Gloucestershire, et cetera, where the biggest problem is whether the silage has been taken in, pro- you know, et cetera. Uh, there really isn't very much for the guy to do. So he has to either invent something or he has to become a barrister. And so where do you think this all ends up, uh, Danny? I, mean, I suppose your point about where well, we get to have the row again about sleaze and, and all of that, but um, it, it does appear to be damaging the government in the polls well it, <coughs> look I, my view is that this issue is a lot about time for a change it, it of course the issue itself is the debate that we have from time to time we've all had the debate about second jobs several times um, and we're having it again mainly because it is a manifestation of the fact that government's been in power quite a long time uh, and yeah. when that happens you generally speaking get moves against the government this the conservative party has for various different reasons to um, been fairly immune to that to the pendulum effect, but that is now happening. Um, I, I think it's politically significant, not in itself, but just as a manifestation of that. And it is one of the things that will determine the election by itself. I think that the pendulum effect, that the, this uh, time for a change effect, puts the next election in play between the Tory majority and not having one, uh, just by itself. Um, and you know, I've ha- I've had some people who do political modelling look at precisely that with the Tory majority a kind of ordinary time for a change swing over a period of years <laughs> would bring you into that vicinity of about 4% swing where the Tories would lose their majority. And that, so what we're... D- that's what I think we should... When you look at these things and you try to think what the political impact of them are, try to distinguish between the signal of it, um, which is time for a change, and the noise, which is the particular issue, the ups and downs of that week, you know, whether Kwasi Kwarteng said this or that. Those are all important in themselves, by the way, that they, they ought to be uh, discussed because of what they say about the individuals. And, and so I'm not sort of saying they're irrelevant, but I'm just saying when you look at the political impact yeah. in two years' time of this, that's, what, that's the way you've got to do it. I've just had this fugitive thought about political modelling since you mentioned political modelling, wondering if it was anything like clothes modelling. You know, sort of, <laughs> so here, in comes Sir Christopher Chopin, he's wearing a rather lovely bit of negativity there. Well, you know, sort of a... Somebody, well, I can't remember what it was that he did wrong, somebody hung... Uh, hung women's pants outside the, uh, the his office. I think it was over yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he came, he arrived at his office and there were uh, women's pants hanging outside. So anyway, maybe that's what... And he had to ask modeling. what they were. <laughs> Let's turn our attention to uh, dramatic matters now. Uh, Should Jews play Jews? Uh, David. Well, I I raise this because the whole business of who should play what uh, has been kind of... I say kind of raging, sort of raging uh, in in recent years for all kinds of reasons. And it's hit the Jewish community now with um, uh, a a Jewish woman comedian, Sarah Silverman, saying, look, why everybody's thinking about why... People can't play each other. You know, famously, West Side Story, the woman who's going to play Maria wasn't allowed to play Maria or didn't allow herself to play Maria because she wasn't Latino um, uh, and so on. Then we have this new drama with Will Ferrell and uh, uh, somebody, Judd, I think his name, I can't, right, Rudd, I can't remember his name. Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd. Sexiest Paul, man in the world. Paul Rudd. Sexy, yeah, no wonder I can't remember, et cetera. Kind of, you know, that's the sort of thing that goes <laughs> straight took your, your title. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. Once you've been demoted, you know, you just kind of try and get over it. And, um, uh, and they're not Jewish, but they're playing a Jewish psychotherapist. OK, bit of a cliche there, but anyway, it's a true story. And the patient and so on. And they're also playing them as quite Jewish people, which is what is called Jew face these days, I gather. And um, and some Jewish people have been objecting to this, or at least saying double standards apply. And I have to say, personally, I have a big worry about this because my view is... It has been increasingly over the years, let anybody play anybody. Actors are paid to act. And actually increasingly, because of the way life works, possibly sometimes the only contact some actors will have with Jews is if they're asked to play them. Um, In other words, they might learn something from the process and other people might learn something from the process. But then I thought, well, Danny, am I way out of whack here? I mean, should we actually get actors far more to, to act the things that they most identify with? No, but it is 
what is true is that you sometimes see people play Jews and you think to yourself, you're really not Jewish and that isn't actually a Do portrayal. You? Yes. I actually, I mean, I know this will sound a terrible thing, but I always thought the father in Friday Night Dinner was like obviously not Jewish, whereas I did think uh, some of the other characters did manage to play Jewish characters quite well. Um, and they were none of them Jewish. One of them, one of them had a sort of Jewish background, but they were none of them Jewish. So it was, it was, um, it's a very tricky one, this. My view is that... Um, Anybody can play anybody as long as they do it well. Yeah. One of the problems with playing people and, and of colour, by the way, if you're not of colour, is that it's you, is that you look preposterous. And so I understand why uh, people think that's a caricature rather yeah. than a portrayal, and they object to it for that reason. So there is a slight difference, I think, between um, you know between what's called minstrelsy and and this, um, because actually I completely understand the offence that's caused. And sometimes I do get offended by people who are not Jewish playing caricature Jews I do but by the way being offended um, you know sometimes you're offended by things and yeah, it's not yeah. the end of the world that either yeah.